This is an alarm sounding in a police station somewhere in the United States. The alarm is meant for you. It's a warning to wake up, to shake loose from the grip of the nation's nightmare. The nightmare described by Senator Herbert O'Connor. Our Senate Crime Investigating Committee has found alarming instances of syndicated crime and of unhealthy alliances with law enforcement officials. The remedy is in the hands of the people who must act before it is too late. The Nation's Nightmare. The CBS Radio Network and its affiliated stations in cooperation with law enforcement agencies throughout the country, present a new documentary series on the pattern of organized crime in America, its shape, its form, who runs it, and what can be done about it. Every voice and sound you will hear has been recorded from real life. Now, here to report to you on the nation's nightmare is the noted CBS newsman, Bill Downs. For many weeks now, we've been looking into the dirty corners of organized crime in America. The picture has not been pretty. But if you were to ask us, what is the worst single spot in the United States today? Where does organized crime most endanger the public safety? We would give you our unanimous answer. The New York, New Jersey waterfront. The record of racketeering, exploitation, extortion, conspiracy, and murder is so foul that it's hard to believe, even when you have the documented proof before you. But it's true, shamefully, unquestionably true. On this, the fifth program of The Nation's Nightmare, we look into crime on the waterfront. The New York Harbor, the greatest port in the world. 11,000 ships enter and leave it every year. $16 billion in cargo pours through its gates every year. Nature outdid herself in the New York Harbor. Its shoreline is 755 miles long, fronting on good deep water. Within the master port lies a network of smaller ports, channels, rivers, and bays. The perfect harbor, the experts say. The perfect harbor, the mobsters and criminals agree. The perfect harbor for getting away with murder. We're passing under the Brooklyn Bridge. We're now rounding the tip of Manhattan Island. Come right aboard the little sightseeing Manhattan. boat that circles There's Manhattan Island. Come aboard for a trip around the port of New York. Come meet the people street. who control the port. You're steaming down the East River, heading for the mouth of the harbor and the Statue of Liberty. On your left is Brooklyn. Brooklyn waterfront controlled by Albert Anastasia, Lord High Executioner of Murder Incorporated. We're passing under the Brooklyn Bridge. On your right is the Lower East Side. Lower East Side controlled by Mike Clementi, Lieutenant of Sox Lanza, One Conviction associate of now-executed murderer Squint Sheridan. There's the Fulton Fish Market. We're now rounding the tip of Manhattan Island. The waterfront from the Fulton Fish Market on the east side to Pier 9 on the west side, the famous tip of Manhattan Island, controlled by Sox Lanza, pal of Lucky Luciano, 10 arrests, now out on parole after conviction for extortion. Directly ahead of you, out on the harbor, is Staten Island. Waterfront controlled by Alex Debrizzi, one conviction organizer for the International Longshoremen's Association, the ILA, now up before the New York State Crime Commission. Off to your left is the Jersey Shore. There's Jersey City. Three groups fighting for control. Upper hand is being held by the Morris Mana mob, fronting for Albert Anastasia. We're now going up the Hudson River. On your right is Greenwich Village. Piers 14 to 52 Hudson River, controlled by the remnants of the Dunn McGrath mob. Ed McGrath, organizer for the ILA, ex-convict, two-time loser, hot springs guest of Joe Adonis, ex-partner of murderer Johnny Cockeye Dunn, who was a pal of Meyer Lansky and Bugsy Siegel. On your left is Hoboken. Controlled by convicted bootlegger Edward Florio, organizer for the ILA, successor to Charlie Yanoski, notorious hijacker and gunman murdered in 1948, who was a pal of Mickey Cohen and Happy Meltzer. And on your right is the Chelsea section which runs from 14th to 23rd Streets. The Chelsea area, piers 53 to 62, split between Timmy O'Mara, one of Killer Oni Madden's mob, and the Ding Dong Bell mob. On your right is Upper Times Square and Upper Midtown Manhattan. 
controlled by the Mickey Bowers mob, home of Local 824 ILA, widely known as the Pistol Local. The New York, New Jersey waterfront, the greatest port in the world, the greatest concentration of mob power in the world. Number one, deck gang. Number one, hull gang. Number one, dock gang. Only you regular men step out. There is organized crime on the New York waterfront because conditions are right for it. These conditions start with the outmoded way in which men are hired for work on the waterfront. You are listening to that hiring. It's called the shape up. Twice a day at 7.55 a.m. and at 12.55 p.m., a group of 200 to 500 longshoremen line up in a semicircle before the pier where the ship is to be loaded or unloaded. The hiring boss, whom you hear, picks out the gangs of men who will work for the next four hours. After that, they are out of a job unless selected again in the next shape-up. The hiring boss, himself a member of the Longshoremen's Union, has absolute power in picking the men. When the mobsters control the hiring boss, it breeds crime and worse. Assemblyman John R. Brooke of Manhattan has tried to get the shape-up abolished. He was opposed by the shipping interests and by the Longshoremen's Union. He can tell you about it. The men are caught in a net from which they cannot extricate themselves. The ones who work are the ones who have been able to curry favor with the pier boss, who have probably paid the highest tribute, who have patronized his friends and relatives, who have borrowed on their future earnings from his money lenders at rates that impoverish him and deprive his wife and children of necessary food and clothing. They must do his bidding or else no work, and no work, no pay. Who were some of these hiring bosses who have absolute power over the men on the piers? Let's look at the most important four docks on the New York waterfront. The piers between Manhattan's 42nd and 50th streets on the Hudson River the piers controlled by the Mickey Bowers mob. James Walsh is manager of the New York City Anti-Crime Committee. He can tell you about these men. Pier 84, birth of the American export lines, the Constitution, the independence. Hiring boss, Danny St. John, ex-convict, over 20 arrests, one prison escape, tried twice for murder in the first degree, jury disagreed both times. Pier 88, birth of the French line, the Ile de France, the Liberté. Hiring boss, Toddy O'Rourke, 10 arrests, sentenced to five years in Sing Sing for grand larceny, a parole violator. Pier 90, birth of the Canard line, the Queen Mary, the Queen Elizabeth. Hiring boss, Jimmy Clifford, 14 arrests for robbery or assault, one year probation for jostling, 18 months in the penitentiary for grand larceny. Pier 92, also the Canard line. Hiring boss, Jimmy McNay, alias Jimmy Hire. Seven arrests, sentenced to the reformatory for unlawful entry and to Eastern State Penitentiary for seven and a half to 15 years for bank robbery. These are the hiring bosses in one section alone. All are members of the Pistol Local. Not all hiring bosses have records, but enough of them do to make anyone cry out, why? Why are they permitted to hold positions of life and death over the jobs of longshoremen? Ask the longshoreman who works under the hiring boss. He can give you the real answer, only he won't. He won't if he knows what's good for him. We wanted to record several longshoremen for this program. No one would talk to us. We finally convinced a number of longshoremen in different parts of the port to talk by guaranteeing that we would not play their voices on the air. They might be identified. You're going to hear their stories, but through the mouths of intermediaries, professional actors. Here are your intermediaries. My name is Bill Quinn. I've heard the waterfront tape recordings. Believe me, they're true. I'll repeat them for you, word by word. I'm Maurice Gosfield. I've heard the recordings, too. We'll try to catch the flavor of the recordings without revealing the people who make them. Ask the longshoreman what would happen to him if he talked. What would happen if he registered a protest? One longshoreman told us this. Here are his words in the voice of Bill Quinn. Well, you can always have an accident. They're very convenient. You could be walking, and the guy could be raising a boom on a crane. Boom weighs about a thousand pounds. And I could just pull a lever and raise it, 
snap what they call a dog on it. And down the boom, no more you. Either that or they uh, put you in a barrel, just throw the cement in, sink you. And then the mud in the Hudson, it has a, has a suction of about 12 feet. So after you hit bottom, you go 12 feet into the mud, they ain't gonna find you no more. But that's necessary only in extreme cases. There's an easier weapon. Longshoremen, no matter how rough, are generally good family men. The mobsters working through the hiring boss can starve them out. Mr. Gosfield. Well, if you make a squawk, you're deprived of work. Definitely fired. You can't go to work on any other pier. You gotta keep your trap shut. You gotta play the game. We asked Ed Florio, organizer for the ILA in Hoboken, and at the same time employer of men as a boss loader, his opinion about the records of some of the men and about crime on the waterfront. This is what he said. This is Ed Florio from Hoboken, ILA organizer for the state of New Jersey. They called me an ex, ex-convict, and I was only arrested once. I was only convicted once, which is conspiracy in the bottling and then that's doing prohibition. And I think that any man, any man that drank liquor doing prohibition was as guilty as I am from, uh, for trying to make it. As for us being racketeers on the waterfront, I can't see, we don't, we don't have racketeers because you gotta work hard. We use men with records. If we didn't, if we didn't employ them, what, what could they do? Use a gun again and go out Go out and do the same thing and go back again? No, we don't do that. We try, we try to re- rehabilitate the man, the man that has a record. We don't specifically go out looking for them. We always have some, some higher ups call us up. Will you please do them a favor or somebody, somebody always interceding for them and we try to help the boys out there is an estimated 35,000 longshoremen working in the New York area. The average longshoreman worked around 1,000 hours in 1950. At $2 an hour, that's an annual wage of around $2,000. The favored few make out better. On certain rare occasions, an outsider gets a first-hand view of what's going on. Bob Green, reporter for the Jersey City Journal, was at the city desk one Saturday when he got a call from a Longshoremen's Union local saying that elections had just been held and new officers were taken over. It was Saturday. The local had 800 members. Only 35 could squeeze into the union headquarters. Bob Green became suspicious. He investigated. And this is the story he turned up. Three men entered the headquarters of local 1247 ILA on Jersey Avenue and Grand Street. They were Morris Manor, a prohibition mobster and former member of the alcohol mob, Barney Cockeye Brown, with a long record, many years served in jail, and George Donahue. Seated in the headquarters of the union were Anthony Slim Lucy, secretary treasurer, and Frank Biffo Di Lorenzo. Manor was the first to speak. He went over to to uh, Di Lorenzo, he said, you're through. Then they told Di Lorenzo, start running, get out, and keep going. He went. The next one that they turned their attentions to was Anthony Slim Lucy. Lucy, open up the safe, they said. I'm not going to do it, said Lucy, who had already signed his resignation. He was rewarded for his efforts with a gun butt across the front of the mouth. It knocked out seven of his teeth and knocked him to the ground. They took several pieces of newspaper, put them on the ground, set fire to them on the floor of the Union headquarters. Lucy's shoeless feet were forced into the fire and held there for several minutes. He suffered severe burns of the feet. That is how three mobsters took over local 1247, ILA, Jersey City. Once the mobsters have taken over a union local or a pier through the hiring boss, once they have driven out the honest union officials, they proceed to make life miserable for the longshoremen. A dozen different rackets flourish, 
all aimed at fleecing the longshoremen of his skimpy pay. Compulsory gambling. If you don't play the numbers or bet with the bookie, you don't get called at the next shape-up. Kickbacks are extorted, especially from Italian, Negro, and Puerto Rican workers. The loan shark racket flourishes. You pay 10% interest per week, 520% interest a year if you are unfortunate enough to hold a loan that long. Numbers, bookmaking, kickbacks, loan sharking are controlled by the mobs. But that's not where they make their big money. The big money comes from organized theft. One of our informants told us how it works. Mr. Gosfield, would you repeat the recording for us? You see, there's two kinds of thieves. There's the uh, commercial thief and there's the guy who steals for home consumption. Uh, take piers 84 to 97. Up there, it's strictly commercial. They steal by the $100,000 weight. You see, they work with the checker. The fellow who checks the cargo when it comes off the ship. You see, the checker has a tally book that shows where every piece of cargo is on the ship before the ship arrives. Well, let's say they want to steal $500,000 weight of watches from Switzerland. Well, they know what they want before the ship gets here. The uh, checker's supposed to get the longshoremen to put the valuable cargo in certain spots on the dock. When they want to steal a certain article, the hiring boss tells the checker and the checker hasn't put it somewhere else. The checker never marks the cargo is coming off the ship. See? It never did arrive in this country. So, it's lost somewhere between here and France, or wherever the ship comes from. You follow me? The cost of waterfront theft and pilferage to insurance companies is $60 million a year, and that's only part of the take. Organized theft is the big moneymaker for the mobs. Second place is held by a little-known $20 million dodge run by the so-called public loaders. Few steamship or company officials will make any direct accusations about waterfront crime. They might have a costly strike on their hands the next day a strike called by the mobsters, with the men having no alternative but to follow orders. The honest union official, the honest businessman, doesn't stand a chance. But there's another reason why he won't make a statement, a much more vicious reason. James Walsh of the New York City Anti-Crime Committee has run up against that reason. Here he is. The big thing we're up against is the attitude of too many of the businessmen on the New York waterfront who feel it's good for business to hire criminals. They say they're not reformers. They're in business to make money. If they have the choice between hiring a tough ex-convict for a boss's job or a man without a criminal record, they'll take the ex-con. The reason? They say the ex-con will keep the men in line and get the most work out of them. The waterfront is a jungle where men spend their lives in fear, where the big eat the little where the secret channels of influence, corruption, and crime flow just beneath the surface. One longshoreman probed that jungle for us and showed us how it works. The legitimate guy is in the middle. Mr. Quinn will repeat the recording for you. You see, the uh, big boys need the tough guys. They need the tough guys to keep me in line so I, I don't get too brazen, upset their way of running things. Now, they, they also need the police department to keep the tough guys in line. If the tough guys go too far, the police cut them down. And then they, they use the politicians to see that the police don't go too far. And they've got the politicians because, well, he can use their muscle men to line up the vote for him. It's a three-ring circus. A legitimate guy's in the middle. The boss of the International Longshoremen's Union is big, burly Joseph P. Ryan. He is president of the union for life. His constitutional powers put him in absolute control over union matters. He appoints and can fire the union organizers, men like ex-convicts Ed Florio, Ed McGrath, and Alex Debrizzi. Mr. Ryan defends the shape-up hiring system. When I went to work Longshore in 1912, you stayed on the pier from 7 o'clock in the morning to 7 at night to protect your job because the hiring stevedore could come out any hour. 
15 minutes after the hour, five minutes after the hour, blow the whistle, and if you weren't there, you lost your opportunity to secure work. These men, through collective bargaining, through their collective strength, have changed that condition that now, if they are not hired at 7.55 in the morning or at 12.55 at noon, they go home till the following morning at 8 o'clock and nobody can take their place. Once a year at a fancy midtown New York hotel, the Joseph P. Ryan Association gives a testimonial dinner to the man they call our standard bearer, Joseph P. Ryan. At that dinner, you can find some strange combinations. Do these important people know about the guests at the other tables? At one table, you'll find the mayor of the city of New York, the Honorable Vincent Impelitari. At another table, you'll find ship jumper Jerry Anastasia, brother of the notorious Albert Anastasia. The chairman of the arrangements committee is the wealthy and influential businessman William J. Bill McCormick, president of the Transit Mix Corporation and the Penn Stevedoring Company. And you can see John A. Coleman, former chairman of the Board of Governors of the New York Stock Exchange, while a member of the reception committee is Willie Cox, who did time in Elmira for biting off the ear of his neighbor. High police officials, high government officials turn out for the dinner. For that dinner is a symbol of political power, a symbol of the votes that come out of the waterfront and its associated industries. This, perhaps, is the ultimate reason behind the waterfront problem. It is politically dangerous to interfere with the setup. So almost everybody in New York, New Jersey, rides the waterfront merry-go-round. And the merry-go-round goes like this. The mayor says it's a job for the police and the DA. The DA says the steamship companies and unions must take the responsibility. The steamship companies say it's a job for the police and the mayor. The police say the waterfront is as quiet as a church. The commissioner of investigation says it's a labor management problem. The union says everybody spreads rumors. None of it is true. We have only started to look at the waterfront crime picture. We haven't mentioned the ship jumpers racket, the dope smuggling, the phony social security cards. But there is something even more ominous. There is a single individual so big, so influential that he cannot be touched. And that individual is the power behind crime on the waterfront. That individual makes politicians, police, and union officials jump. That individual is Mr. Big. We think we know his name. People who really understand the waterfront know his name too. They all agree on who is Mr. Big. Bill Keating is assistant manager of the New York City Anti-Crime Committee and a former assistant district attorney of New York. He can tell you about Mr. Big. Mr. Big is an important, respectable businessman. He's a churchgoer. He contributes to charitable causes. He is a close friend of governors, mayors, and important political figures past and present. He started out on the Lower West Side of New York City. His first work was driving a one-horse wagon in the market. He became involved in a struggle for power in one of the locals of the Teamsters Union. Early in World War I, he was involved in the loading of meat for the American troops in Europe and made a fortune at it. It was a rough business. Three contemporaries, Mickish Keating, Tanner Smith, and Rubber Shaw were murdered. With money to back him, he stepped in and took over more and more unions on and off the waterfront. He found himself in a handy little position. On the one hand, he controlled certain key union locals. On the other hand, he owned and operated the very businesses that those key unions serviced. This put him in a beautiful position to make even more money. He obtained juicy city contracts. He expanded his empire into more and more unrelated businesses. Politically, while he has been identified with one party, he plays both sides of the fence. And he sees to it that each party gets its share of whatever labor support he can deliver and that each party gets its share of campaign contributions. No one has been able to prove that Mr. Big has committed a crime. But win the confidence of any old-time longshoreman, any veteran newspaper reporter, any cop who knows the West Side, and he'll tell you the name of Mr. Big. Who is Mr. Big? Well, who is Mr. Big? We can't tell you his name because there's not enough legal evidence to back up what every seasoned waterfront investigator knows but we are convinced he is the real power behind the throne. What can be done about crime on the waterfront? 
Well, the New York City Anti-Crime Committee, a group of private citizens organized to fight the gangsters, is a start. Sproul Braden, former ambassador to Argentina, heads the organization. He can sum it up for us. The Port of New York, the greatest port in the world, is being strangled by inefficiency, but even more by crime and by political corruption. This is not a local matter. It affects every citizen in every one of the 48 states. These conditions have existed for over 30 years, and they must not be permitted to endure any longer. The organized gangsters and racketeers must be driven off the waterfront. The archaic means of hiring, defended by the International Longshoremen's Union and the shipping interests, must be improved. The pattern of police connivance and political corruption must be cleaned up. And the powers behind the throne, the shadowy people who hide behind the cloak of respectability, they must be exposed. This is your problem. You must do something about it now. Will you do something about it, or will you let the rackets go on, the violence go on, the murder go on, the murder of good people, honest people, who only seek to lead a decent life on the waterfront of the greatest port of the nation, the murder of men like Wally Aludo, who only three months ago was about to become hiring boss on Pier 3 in Hoboken. The mob did not approve of him. He might interfere with the operation of their racket, they killed him at Union headquarters in Hoboken. Do you want to know what kind of a man he was? His widow, Mrs. Elizabeth Aludo, can tell you. She speaks for the record. She did not want her voice impersonated by any actress. She speaks to you. They didn't come any better. His greatest, oh, he felt as if the world was his when he could talk about the kids and how they went to school and where they went to school and how he hoped to see them graduate and how he felt that they were getting someplace in the world that in the future he could feel as if they'd never have to work as hard as he and I did. His last thoughts, his dying thoughts, was his home. He has someone very close to him to pay a telephone bill and a gas and electric bill. And he was dying. How this could have happened, I don't know. I don't know. I can't, I can't accept it as yet. I've been to the cemetery, I know it's so, and yet I can't believe it. I keep waiting for that key in the door. <laughs> you have just heard program number five of The Nation's Nightmare, narrated by Bill Downs, presented transcribed as a public service by the CBS Radio Network, written and produced by Irving Gitlin. Special acknowledgement to the numerous longshoremen who risked their lives to give us the information used in this program. This is the CBS Radio Network.